Welcome to, uh, to another uh, testimony, people. I uh, hope that you will be encouraged and edified, especially those of you that uh, go out and preach or stand outside of an abortion clinic. I think this one is going to move you. As you can tell by the wonderful landscape, I'm in New Orleans. And uh, there's absolutely nothing new in New Orleans. We come here at least twice a year to preach. And um, we have a, a blessing. We have somebody here who has been converted to Christianity and what a testimony she has. And not only does she have a testimony, but she's actually out there preaching for Jesus Christ and not ashamed. And the same energy that she had when she was a heathen, she now has uh, uh, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, my sister and your sister, uh, Jennifer. And so, Sister Jennifer, can you explain to everybody a little bit of, um, did you, uh, were you a, a smart person? Did you, um, or were you just involved in drugs? I mean, you know, did you actually have uh, good grades in school or what, what happened? Yes, I was a uh, 4.0 honor student, valedictorian, class president, every senior, every, you know, award that could be won in school, I won before I turned to drugs. So. You know, don't think that if a person uh, turns to drugs, uh, they're miserable and they, they lived a bad, shallow life. Do understand, especially for you parents that are raising your kids properly, uh, you better pay attention to what's going on because you had this. And sister, when you got involved in drugs, uh, what, was, what was the amount of drugs that you were at the peak taking? At the peak, um, it was, I uh, had a $600 a day drug habit. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, what did you do for a living to get this type of money? I was a prostitute on Bourbon Street. On I Bourbon danced. Street. Uh, were you a dancer? Did you, uh, were you working in the clubs? Yes, I worked on all of the clubs on Bourbon Street and the little side streets. Wow. Uh, now, you know, sister, we've been going down Bourbon Street. I've been going there for uh, probably in the early 80s. You ever see any of the guys out there preaching with the banners? Yes. So over the next, over after I graduated from high school and I decided to work at the strip clubs, um, for the next 20 years, basically over and over every day, every day, not every day, but like every occasion that y'all would come and I'd see the banners out there, it would anger me. And um, I remember leaving the strip clubs and just going up and just following y'all with the banners and just spitting on y'all because I was so angry. Because I was being convicted of what was going on. I was being convicted of the sins. I wasn't stupid. You know, it's just, it's what I had become. And it's amazing. A God only, not only cleaned her up, but she's actually now part of our group. Yes. She uh, wanted to come out and, uh, you know, she goes to a local church here. And uh, boy, let me tell you, it's a, it's a blessing. You know, when you come to New Orleans, you can have tours in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, graveyards. You can have tours of seeing what the French Quarter is, the plantation. By having Jennifer on our side, some of the things that she exposed, even within the gay bars, the drugs, the rooms that we don't see, and uh, there's a reason why we're there with a very hard message. Uh, places that she's taken me to restaurants that they will deliver food. You say the right code words, and you get drugs in your take-home food or when they deliver it to your house. There's a little bit more than what most of us see, and it's great to have this sister with us. And uh, Sister, were you involved in any satanic things? Yes, I was. I was um, from 1995 to 2004, I held uh, the title of um, High Priestess for the Religious Order of Witchcraft in New Orleans. Wow. So I held the bylaws and stuff like that, and um, I taught. I was often found in the cemeteries doing spells and for hire if anybody needed spell work done or anything like that. So, um, you know, and then if, if, a, if a new shop wanted to open, they'd have to consult with me, and I would teach them. So a lot of the people that see me now out there at one point or another probably were my students. Wow. It's amazing that... Uh you know, a lot of us have heard about uh, satanic rituals and things that go on, sex, blood. 
You know, guys like me that's never been involved in that, I've always thought it was exaggerated, or it makes a good Hollywood movie, or a good program. Sister, is there any truth to all of that stuff? Yes, it's very, very real. And here in New Orleans, I mean, I know that because that's a part in that. So, you know, at all the major, you know, witches have different uh, Sabbaths and black masses. So at all of those events, people are drinking blood. They're partaking in that kind of stuff and ritualistic killing of animals, drinking of blood, sexual magic, stuff like that's all taking place at now, all times. In your testimony, sister, uh, is it just, you know, homeless people that uh, get involved in this, uh, young kids that have run away from home? Or are we talking judges and politicians and yes. police? Yes, judges, politicians, police officers, all the higher ups of the city have part in that. And I speak this because I, I know it to be true because I've done it. You know, I've either been a prostitute with them or, you know, and in the satanic world too. Like most of the people, you know, they are into Druidism and they wear, you know, the hoods with the, the mask and so if somebody in there is not in that world, they won't be able to pick them out. But this whole city is run by that. Wow. It's amazing. You know, it's not just the, the people that you see on the videos that are on drugs or they're just like, hail Satan. That's just, that's like distraction. That's not what is really going on. You know, uh, the people that have the most money are usually the most involved in the deep things that are going on. And that I've not seen. This city, for some reason, has the, um, you know, every city has a principality or a power. You know, when you fly into Washington, D.C., and you get off a plane, you can sense the power of that city. By a stroke of a pen, your country may not exist anymore. You come to Los Angeles, you can see how, how music and TV can influence the world in the fashion, and how New York has its own principality. Here in New Orleans, uh, you know, it's it's amazing the amount of voodoo, witchcraft, uh, satanic that takes place behind the scenes, behind just the, it's just a party city. Right. And so uh, people do get bewitched, use that word, bewitched when they get off the plane here. What's right is now wrong, what's wrong is now right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I've always preached when we're on Bourbon Street that just going into some of these clubs, just going into some of these nude places, you're going to come out with demons. You thought you had problems? Where do you find out when you leave these places? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's also a testimony for many of you that stand outside nude bars. Hey, don't give up on hope. Now, these girls out there can get saved. And not only saved, mm -hmm. but actually bearing fruit of their salvation. Yes. And so, uh, sister, one of the things that kind of encouraged you is uh, after coming to some churches here in uh, New Orleans, you felt compelled to come to one of our conferences yes. out in Las Vegas. Yes. And when I got your name that you were coming in, I thought, wow. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a gal who's raising her son, who you know doesn't have much money, and how she's getting to Las Vegas from New Orleans is a couple of days on a Greyhound bus. It's not like you that can fly in. But she wanted to pay her own way just to hang around some active Christians. And so, uh, sister, did you get turned off or whatever happened after that meeting? After that meeting, that was like a major turning point in my walk with the Lord. Um, I got there and just immediately saw a whole different caliber of men, of people that here in New Orleans, I didn't even know, I didn't know that existed. And I left there with just a fire, a burning desire just to go home and get in the Word and just, I mean, I was on just fire for God. And it just encouraged me to keep going because, you know, a lot of people, they don't know that. They don't have that. My, I didn't know that men like you really existed. Yes. You know? And we've been having these conferences since 1990-ish. And so uh, uh, we started off in Oregon. We've got them all over the place. I know nowadays there's several conferences going on. We were the ones that really put it together for open air preachers to encourage each other, exhort each other, and even young ones coming in. Also for those of you who don't like women preachers, maybe you can make a modification. You know, because 
I talked to Jennifer and I said, Sister, uh, can you do me a favor? When you're on Bourbon Street tonight and you preach, address the women. And she did. She addressed the women. We constantly address the men. She addressed the women. For me, as I'm always standing back, making sure everybody's doing their job, there were women just standing there looking at her. You know, they've been hearing this message from a guy, not a girl. And so uh, she has the same Holy Ghost you men have. And if you men don't step up to the plate, God's going to use women. So uh, I say the burden's on you. Now, speaking of women preachers, sister, we, uh, we met you when we came to New Orleans at an abortion clinic, and you were preaching there. So for those of you guys that say women shouldn't be preaching, there's another window that you would have to at least concede women can preach. You know, must I remind you, it was a woman in a well who had a horrible reputation that actually turned the whole city over to Jesus. It was a woman who actually preached that Jesus rose from the dead while the men were in hiding. And so I know uh, oftentimes I'm considered a hardcore guy, but on this stance, some of you, even my fellow preachers, might consider me very liberal. But I believe that uh, their time has come where women can stand up and preach. And I'll ask her sometimes, look, you got some guys that might, uh, might find it offensive. Sister, just address the women. She don't say, uh, don't tell me what to do, Brother Reuben. The Lord will tell me what to do. Yes, brother, I'll go ahead and do that. And she did that. And she did it quite well. She actually was able to say things to women that you and I cannot say. And it's coming from a woman. And uh, I, I was blessed to see that. Now, sister, you've had abortions in your life. I, I attempted to have two. Two? Wow. And what, what happens on those abortions? I mean, how does it, how does it hinder your psyche? Um, it just, it really, it, it, it not going through with it, of course, praise the Lord, but just going there in attempts to have that and then afterwards it just makes you want to kill yourself and just engage in more activity trying to fill that, that void, that hole, that just nothing at all. You know, I've searched my whole life trying to fill that hole with money, sex, power, drugs, Satan, whatever, and nothing filled that hole until Jesus came in and filled it. Now, uh, what about a simple trip to McDonald's and you hear babies cry? What would that do to you? Trigger. It would trigger it off. Um, for years after, I know um, before my, my son was born, um, on Mother's Day, for example, uh, I would just be just, I would go out and just get as, as loaded as I could to just try to like bear that, that guilt, that shame, even though I had my daughter. I had just put on someone's doorstep, you know, just trying to get rid of her. You know, I knew I did the right thing by having her, but I mean, I didn't raise her. I was, I was heavily in drugs. But still, I know women that have had visions of dead babies and, and crying and they'll just trigger it off and then you live in that, that shame, that guilt, that condemnation. So, uh, if it's not under the blood, let me tell you, uh, women can live in a world of depression Antidepressant drugs may not do it. It might be seasonal. And so, uh, uh, sister, did you ever see any signs outside of abortion clinics of people trying to tell you not to do that? Yes. In fact, for both of my children that, you know, I did have, if it wasn't for these guys with the signs, I would have went through with the abortion. I was convicted by the signs to go home that I was doing the wrong thing. And if it wouldn't have been for that, I probably would have had the abortion because at that point I had no conscience about what I was doing. You know, I mean, there was a small voice telling me it's wrong, but really I was so selfish and so, it was just, it didn't matter. But those signs just stuck in my head. Like, it, you know, it convicted me that it was wrong. You know, when the Bible says God's word does not return void, here's proof. For those of you who say street preaching gets no, no fruit at all, not only is this fruit, but fruit bearing fruit. And so, you know, what a testimony and an encouragement for you uh, to, um, to know uh, that uh, you can stand outside with that sign and it does influence people when they leave. It may not make an impact at the moment, but it does when they leave. And so uh, it's an honor uh, working with this with sister. And usually I tell you, you know, in some of the hard places that we preach, we just try to bring men along. 
but uh, here in Weekend of Decadence, uh, she came and she held her banner. It was tugged. She she had things going on in her world that uh, I'm sure she's going to have a few stories for quite some time. But she hung with the guys, and so uh, what a blessing it is uh, to work with this sister. That God cleaned her up, and what a testimony to go actually to the same street that she involved herself in sin and preached the gospel. And so uh, I really appreciate you, sister, and I'm sure we're probably going to be working a, a little more together. And for those of you that don't like women preachers, at least maybe concede there are windows and places where women should preach, where guys don't really have the voice. And an abortion clinic, or even out in the street, addressing women, how they dress, what they're doing, uh, is, uh, is unique. I mean, the way she was preaching, uh, it was much better than most guys can do only because it's coming from a female. And so uh, do understand that if you're a gal who's thinking about doing more than just passing out tracks, I hope this, uh, this testimony uh, encourages you. Uh, thank you for all your prayers. Please continue to pray for us as we plow the streets, as we were here on Labor Day weekend, uh, laboring in the hot heat humidity. And of course, like I said, you can tell we're in wonderful New Orleans. <laughs> hey, just for extra credit, if you will, uh, you know, Sister Jennifer, her testimony is true. She's got satanic symbols tattooed all over her place, all over her body. And so uh, she is, uh, she's not stretching the story. I know oftentimes people kind of stretch the story. But if you want more on how she preached, we're going to add a little bit of, of, of her preaching at the abortion clinic, which was her testimony. And it's, uh, it's quite shocking what she, what she came from and how God did deliver her. And it's amazing. It should show us hope. When we're preaching to those lost souls out there, and as street preachers, we see them at their rawest, at the worst. Hey, there's still hope for these people. I don't go to homosexual parades because I believe they're all going to hell. I still have hope that they're going to live and repent one day and get saved. And so uh, I hope you enjoy about 15, 20 minutes of, this, uh, of her preaching outside the... Uh, the um, abortion clinic, and again, I hope this would inspire some girls to be Deborahs in the Bible. Yeah, you know, y'all are out here, y'all are scared of little or us, and you gotta call the cops. You know what you need to be afraid of? You need to be afraid of the wrath of God, because it's coming. The wrath of God is coming, and God is angry at the wicked every day. That's what the Bible tells us, not sometimes. Just a little time. bit of time. But time. every single day. Do you think y'all are not wicked out here? Walking around mocking God. The Bible says that wicked, cursed wicked, is wicked. any man that takes a bribe to slay an innocent. That's right. All of y'all are doing that. If not, just, you know, it's guilt by association. Y'all are all part of this. This land is cursed. And the reason why we're here is because we live here. This is our community. We're taking it back. And there's nothing you could do about it. You might be here now, but you'll be burning in hell soon enough. None of y'all, none of y'all want to turn around and repent. And that's what you should be doing. That's what you should be doing. Because you're going to notice that, you know what? Your children are going to start getting sick. Maybe you'll start getting sick. Maybe you'll die. You don't care. You don't care. You think it's hot out here right now with your sunglasses and everything else, the hats? Imagine how hot it's going to be in hell where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing your teeth. You don't care about that either, do you? Yep, no. You said it right there. You know what I'm saying? Mocking God, mocking God, mocking God. Be afraid of God. Don't be afraid of little old us that you got to call the cops. But anyway, on another subject, let me just tell, I'm talking to the women in there, not the wicked people out here. The, wi the women in there, I have sympathy for you. Okay? Many of you were deceived about what the word love actually means. Because we live in a society today that everybody's hearts have become hardened.
by TV, by what we allow to come into our eyes, to our ears, around us. We become hardened. And I don't just say this because I'm some kind of hypocrite out here. You know what? I used to be worse than any one of you, I guarantee you that. Am I proud of that? No, I'm not proud of that. I humbled myself, got down on my knees, and cried out for the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my life and save an evil person like me. And if you save somebody like me, he could save you too. It's not too late to turn it all around. But obviously some of y'all just don't care. And that's truly sad. But let me get back to what love is. Love is us being out here on this hot day, sweating, preaching to you who don't even care. That's love because we don't want to see you going to hell where there's no coming out of it. Once in any stuff, that's going to be repetition. Repetition. Day after day after day for all eternity. Who are you going to call them and call to save you? They'll probably be there with you. Really? But anyway, for the women that are in there, let me tell you something. I was 19 years old when I got pregnant the first time. And at that point in my life, my heroin habit was about $300 a day. Not too much. Not too much. $300 a day, shooting it up my arm. Didn't care. Didn't care who I was sleeping with. I was sleeping with man, woman. It didn't matter. That's how crazy I was. That's how demon-possessed and crazy I was. I was worshiping the devil as well. I used to come out here and I used to spit on these people because I used to think, oh, oh God, the Jesus freaks are there. Thank God for these Jesus freaks. Thank God because my both my children would be dead right now if it wasn't for people like this who came here day after day after day trying to help you, trying to let you know that there's an easier way there's another way, and it's Jesus Christ. It's so simple, you make it so complex. Open your eyes. Open your ears and listen to what I'm saying because it's true. When I went to go have the abortion for my daughter, I was so cold-hearted, I didn't even care. All I thought about was, oh, great, now I'm pregnant. I'm going to have to stop shooting dope. I'm going to have to have this kid. And I hated kids. The sound of their voice irritated me. Like the sight of y'all right now. But anyway, they had these people out here that were preaching Jesus. I didn't believe in Jesus. I believed in Satan. I was into witchcraft and everything else. But you know what? When this guy touched my shoulders and looked in my eyes. That's good. That's good. Oh, but the police aren't here, so now you can talk. Anyway, so Keep this man sharing, opened my eyes. Amen, amen. This man opened my eyes, and he told me, you don't have to kill your child. Go home. And in his eyes, I saw the love of God for the first time in my life. I felt it. And I and, and still, there was still that doubt, that doubt that hangs in front of all of us, that little bit of doubt that says, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because my life, because the devil still had his grips on me. He had his hooks in me. I was his right-hand woman. You know? So I went inside, and when I went inside, they made, you know, I paid $500. They made us watch a video on what we would go through. They assured us they were going to give us some Valium and this and that, and I was like, oh, good, I'll get some more drugs for free before I kill my kid. Then I learned that, you know what, at four weeks after conception, your baby has fingernails. You know, I mean, it was truly disturbing. And it was like a mill. People were just walking in, walking out, walking in, walking out. You're not even realizing that's a bigger thing. Your babies are being sacrificed to another guy. Y'all don't even realize that because you're so deceived by the devil right now. It's so crazy. But that's, you know, all this is, this is, this is happening for a reason for such a time like this. God's coming back to judge you. God have mercy on you. Thanks God, I realized while I was sitting in there that what I was about to do would irrevocably change my life forever. And I got up and I ran out of there and ran home. I chose to stop using drugs. 
and have that little baby. Now, when I had the baby, I'm 19 years old, and the baby starts crying. I don't know that babies cry when they need food. Couldn't nobody ever told me that. You know, since I was born, I was molested by my grandfather, by pedophiles, raped by my stepfather, and by everybody else. I didn't know nothing about life. I didn't have a mom who told me things like that. You know, so the baby starts crying. I've been aggravated. I put it in a car seat and go drop it off on somebody's doorstep. And notice I'm saying the word it because I was still so wicked I didn't even realize that that was my daughter. I referred to it as an it. I dropped it off on someone's doorstep, went to the dope man, and got high. Not caring one ounce in my heart where that baby was. She was on somebody's doorstep. Nothing like that. I did not care. Okay? Thank God that baby miraculously got back to my family. My aunt was able to adopt her and give her a life that I could not give her. Even though I was as wicked as I was, I knew not to put a baby in a situation where it was going to be a shooting gallery where everybody's going to be shooting drugs at all times. Because there's other choices. We're out here. I'll adopt your baby and raise your baby with my son. How about that? I'll, I'll adopt everybody's babies in there and raise them so you don't kill them. Go home and do more drugs because that's where you're headed. Because that's what it's going to lead to. It led me. That's what it did to me. I'm not out here being a hypocrite. I'm telling you the truth. So you know what? After that, that's exactly what happened. I started living in the shame and the guilt of dropping my baby off somewhere. I didn't know it because I was so deceived. But more drugs, more drugs, more men, more sex, more whatever. Trying to fill this hole inside of me that nothing in this world could ever fill besides Jesus Christ. That empty void that we all feel because we're human beings. You can't deny that. All of us, that emptiness, that food, sex, drugs, whatever, nothing will be able to fill. But you know what? Jesus filled it. Jesus filled it. No many, how many times I tried to commit suicide, it wouldn't work. I stopped trying to commit suicide because it just wouldn't work. See, God had other plans for me. So as time went on, my dope habit grew to $600 a day just for my portion and I got married so I had to take care of him I didn't know that the man was supposed to take care of the lady I didn't know that nobody taught me that so I had to go out every day and prostitute so I could take care of my husband and feed us and provide a roof over our heads and our drug habits so we had what a twelve hundred dollar a day dope habit just with that that's not the extras that's not rent bills everything else that I'm out there prostituting for day after day after day after day repetitious repetitious and I remember thinking, man, this is hell. Boy, that is not, it's nothing like hell. And y'all are going to find out soon enough, and that's what's sad. It's truly, truly sad. Mm. So 10 years later, you know, after that, I went through cancer. I got cervical cancer. You know, thank God I don't have HIV. I don't know how that didn't happen. Only by a miracle of God. Okay? So, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and they told me, you know what, you're never going to have kids again. Your womb is polluted. And you know what? I started jumping up and down. Yay! I can keep on going to prostitute. I can keep having sex. I can keep doing what I'm doing because I'm so selfish and deceived and disgusted. And so I, I go. I have a one night stand on my husband. Well, not a one night stand. I was a prostitute anyway, but we had this little fake loyalty thing. I go sleep with some other guy that I th think I like and guess what? He has testicular cancer, has one of his testicles removed. Not supposed to ever get anybody pregnant. My womb has been polluted. I've gone through cancer. Ten years later, I show up pregnant for my mm. second time. And this time, everything had multiplied and I said, oh no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Ma'am, there's other options. We come out here and pray for you. Can you get that reverse? So anyway, 
I just I went to back to the abortion clinic and the same people that are out here right now were out there again. And when I was walking up, I said, oh, no, the Jesus people are out there again. But you know what? That was because I was so full of pride and I didn't even know it. It's a spirit called Leviathan, in case you're interested. Just a little bit more knowledge for you, smarty pants. And, uh, you know... I decided, they talked to me again, they prayed with me, and I decided to keep my son. But you know what? Did I stop using drugs? No, I didn't. I used drugs in abundance the whole time I was pregnant for my son, because I was mad. The whole time I was blaming it on God, I was so mad at God. But you know what? Deep down, I was mad at myself. I was a 4.0 honor student valedictorian scholarship to New York University. Turned it all down to go strip on Bourbon Street. Tell me if that's not satanic influence. Who makes a, a sane person do something like that? So I used drugs hoping that maybe they would kill my son. Uh, you know, I had CPS on me. I was faking my drug test every way I could trying to deceive them, trying to deceive everybody. But the devil was just deceiving me all along. But there's something higher than that. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because he had his hand on me the whole time. He had his hand on me the whole time. When I went to get birth from my son, it was right after Mardi Gras. I was rolling on ecstasy. I had just shot up cocaine, shot up about $600,000 of dope, smoked weed, you name it. Probably had sex with a couple of people that day. And I went into labor. So I show up at the hospital, get out the car the weeds coming out the car, my mom's like, you should be real proud of yourself. Gave my mom the middle finger, went in and had my son. So the next day I'm waiting for the woman to come in and take my son because they were hot on my trail. They knew what I was about. They knew I was a, a liar. I was. I'm not going to hide it. <laughs> Keyword was. Anyway, the woman comes in and I'm about to knock her out just because of that pride, that ego. And she says, Jennifer, you did it. And I smiled with this wicked smile and I said, I did, didn't I? What? And she goes, you stayed clean your whole pregnancy. She said, there's not a trace of drugs in your system or your sons and you could bring them home. <laughs> now if that's not a miracle from Jesus Christ, I don't know what that is, okay? And I looked at her and I said, I did. They had a tragic I did stay clean. Mind. And I'm looking at my mom like, you better not say a word, woman. You know, so I left with my son and decided that I needed to start seeking help. Because if that wasn't another wake-up call besides all the millions of other ones I've had before then that are so supernatural I can't even explain. And that's what I did. You know what? Thank God I did that. Because my son is 14 years old today. And he's going to be out here one day. You're going to hear his voice roar also. Yeah. Thank God for my son. Because he's my best friend. Don't kill the baby already. Don't kill the baby. You know, and I know a lot of women that have had these abortions. And they are plagued by nightmares of dead babies. It's like you being cursed. Watch. Watch what God's going to do. God have mercy on each and every one of your souls. You know, like I said, y'all are so fearing. Y'all got to call the cops. What y'all going to do when God Almighty comes out here? I don't know. Yeah. Accept Jesus now. Repent and turn away. You know, and it's not just so easy. Okay, God, accept Jesus. It takes effort. You gotta put stuff down. You gotta start changing your mind. You gotta start reading the Bible and obeying it. Yeah, obey. Obey it. Obedience obey. is the highest form of worship. It's in God. So that's what we're doing out here. We're being obedient to our Lord, our Heavenly Father, while y'all are serving Satan. God have mercy on you.